Hi, welcome. I'm Annalie Maley and this is Under the Surface. Today, our first guest is Mitch Creek. Hi, Mitch. How are you doing? I'm very, very good. I'm very thankful to be here. How was your weekend? I heard you had a weekend off. What did you get up to? Um, look, it was the first time we've really had two days off for a while and probably the only time for the rest of the season we'll get two days off. So, Simon Mitchell kind of thankfully granted us the time. Um, but Saturday was pretty much a catch-up day. I uh, actually said before we started here that I've been kind of building a kid's booklet based around mental health and resilience training, goal-setting implementation review, which is actually a great segue into today. But yes. um, I've been working on that quite a bit, finished it as of today, uh, finally and officially. So that was really great. Um, I actually went and bought a motorbike in Echuca on Saturday. <laughs> One popped up out of, out of the blue on Facebook Marketplace. My mate sent it to me. I've been trying to get another one um, while mine's getting repaired and I'm going to sell it. Mm. And we got to Echuca. We left at 5 o'clock like we found it at 3 o'clock, left at 5. And uh, we got home at midnight and got eaten alive by mozzies. I'm not sure if anyone's been aware, but the floods have made chaos yeah. of yeah. the mozzies. Like we malaria is that. on the way to my body right now. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was pretty cool. But then uh, Sunday was just down on a friend's farm about two hours pretty much east of here in the hills and, you know, they run off uh, solar power and generators. They've got a huge shed. They've got a 65-acre property and 60 acres is forestation and just hills and it's just beautiful. So sat by the lake, shot some guns, rode the bike and, yeah, just had a, a really kind of centering weekend. That's awesome. That's so wholesome. It was funny. I was just saying to the guys before you got here that when I had called you on Sunday, I was sitting on the top of a rock in, on Mount Alexander looking out at my view and I had asked you what you were doing. <laughs> You're like, I'm just lying on the grass taking in the day. Like, yeah. I was like, I like the vibe. It's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so the motorcycles, is that a hobby for you? That's something you've been doing for a while or? Yeah, I grew up obviously in Horsham in Country Vic, but yeah. that's where being on a bit of land, five or six acres and then 20 acres for a little bit before we moved back into town with the family. But bikes have always been something that you kind of have on, on the farm. We yeah. didn't really have motorbikes per se, but we had three wheelers. Uh, we had a trike for a little bit. Um, the three wheeler was kind of the notorious thing in the in the family, but that soon got thrown out the window when I kind of went over a, a jump on it and <laughs> went over the bars and the, the four, three-wheeler actually basically nearly compressed my spine through oh, my God. body. So, that didn't last very long afterwards. But um, bikes have always been something that I've, I've really loved. Just the – you put your helmet on, whether it's a dirt bike, a road bike, a race bike, a, a mini GP bike that I've just bought, which yeah. is a kid's race bike. Um, <laughs> any of these things, you put the helmet on and it's just you yeah. and – it's like a fine motor skill that you have to learn to ride a bike, mm -hmm. even though it's a big 200 kilo thing. It's all in your fingers. Like you're, yeah. you're rolling on throttle, you're feeling the back of the tire and how much grip you have yeah. like on a road racing track. For instance, you can feel everything and the better you get, the more you can feel. And it's such yeah. a, it's like a connective thing that you find. And for me, it's about having those things outside of a crazy lifestyle that's kind of in your face and the fishbowl effect. So Whatever I can to get away from it, bikes is certainly probably the number one thing. That's so cool. It's always cool to hear people's hobbies outside of sport, especially as like a professional athlete, you think we don't have time for things, but it's important that we make time. That's a good segue for me to ask you about your upbringing, your childhood. So you grew up in Horsham. Um, what were you like as a kid? Like if, if someone was going to describe Mitch Creek as a young child, what would they say about you? I would say a majority of people would have said um, sporty. Um, I think a big part of it probably was a little bit of I was my own kind of person. I sometimes had, you know, tips in my hair. I had, you know, some purple or I had a bit of a mullet or, you know, I was just I did my own kind of thing as well. Like I had a lot of different crowds that I spent time with. Like I skate, I was a skater for <laughs> quite a few years. Like I had a like BMX and mountain bikes that we used to take to the skate parks mm -hmm. and we had the land and stuff for a little bit. So my dad was a, a builder and he used to build us like freestyle like ramps and stuff like that. So and good. we used to, you know, have 20, 30 kids on the weekend out at the property and everyone would have a shovel and a spade and we'd be <laughs> in the, you know, shoveling dirt and, and making tracks and it was like proper rhythm sections. It was awesome. And uh, to have that kind of upbringing, you, you realize like you're, you're happy to be, you know, down and dirty and rough and ruggedy yeah. and around the edges. Yeah. And I think that translates to today parts of me. But then at the same time, I was a pretty 
you know, solo kid. Like I was, I felt like I was a little excluded. A lot of my friends from primary school went to the public school. Yeah. I went to the private school. My sister was five years older than me. Shout out Shannon. Happy birthday today too. Um, birthday. It's her birthday. Uh, she's on a five-day retreat, no phones, no nothing. So, it's unreal. So, it's pretty cool that uh, we're doing this today. But yeah, she went to the private school and was very, you know, well-educated, took in, you know, reading, writing, literature, stuff like that really well. But I couldn't sit still for more than, you know, 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Like it was... For me, it was so hard to just sit in the classroom mm. and take in information. I was a very yeah. visual and a very physical person. Like I had to have my hands on it yeah. to try, you know, oh, this is a microphone. Great. Oh, cool. I'd pick it up <laughs> yeah. and look at it and how does it work rather than go, oh, let's learn about the microphone. I'd yeah. be like, let's plug it. Un- let's, does this come off? Like, yeah, yeah does take this it apart, break? Put it back together. Yeah. Can I, can I, you know, dong it on the table? Will it break? <laughs> like, is it a good one? Yeah. Um, so, that's how it was as a kid. But I kind of had, you know, the, the BMX crew. I had the skaters and then I had little athletics i had i was a gymnast so i did trampoline double mini some floor stuff you know i did all these different sports i played a bit of soccer footy cricket so i kind of had people from everywhere but i never really had a really good you know solid circle that i could spend my days with at school yeah as i said my my couple of best friends went to the public school i went to the private so Mm -hmm. i felt like i was always just bouncing around trying to fit in but yeah. I never, I never did fit in. Yeah. I just felt like a bit of a loner. Um, yeah. I was skinny and awkward, heaps of pimples, you know, yeah. crazy kind of hairdos, and I just trying to be that person. You know, as I said, tips were in back then. Yeah. They had the tip cap and they'd pull and they're it through. They're coming back in. They're coming back. Yeah, in. I got the blonde hair at the yeah, moment. I've yeah. just gone overboard. But <laughs> that's it's kind of how my childhood felt. Like I just didn't know where I belonged, and I didn't yeah. know if I fit in anywhere. I just kind of made myself fit you know i was the i was the square block in the round hole but the yeah. round hole was big enough that the square block actually did fit yeah you kind of cheated but yeah it was it was a bit of a hard upbringing because i just didn't really have a place i didn't think did you have support from your family are you close with your family yeah incredibly close i literally speak to my family probably every day or two mm. um via text from, you know via family chat you know yesterday we we're sending photos and videos of the day and all the things that happened and i spoke to my mum before this and yeah, my dad and I are extremely close as well. My sisters are everything to me. Like I would throw everyone in this room out the window to save my <laughs> sister today. So, um, yeah. yeah, they're everything to me. So that feeling of like being kind of different and being that square block in the circle hole and um, doing all these extracurricular activities, how did you narrow that down to be like, oh, you know what, basketball? Or do you feel like throughout your kind of upbringing you were able to kind of keep doing everything until you couldn't like what was that transition like to you to kind of narrow it down to the one thing I did do a lot of different activities but I think they all kind of helped me become a better footballer and a better basketballer because mm-hmm. everything narrowed into those two when I grew and I had growth spurts you know knees and ankles you had the patella tendonitis every tall kid goes through it yeah but it was so bad for me that like I had to stop trampolining I had to stop gymnastics and I stopped kind of doing little athletics and then it was I stopped doing and the next thing and I narrowed the focus down to footy and basketball and I really love I love footy I still love footy I've got a footy in the car that pretty much travels (laughs) everywhere and if there's a nice day and there's someone that's I'm with you know hey let's go for a kick like it's great you know you try and find someone else to take a few speckies over unknowingly but (laughs) you just you know you you don't know what you're really going to be good at and it doesn't matter if you're good at it Mm -hmm. and I never wanted to be just great at basketball or great at footy I didn't know what I wanted to do. One of my goals as a kid, I remember <laughs> writing down on a piece of paper, I remember seeing someone wrote down, go, oh, you write down your goals, or you're dreaming you can achieve it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds really cool, just do it. And yeah. I remember finding them about five years, six years later when I was like 12, 13, and it was yeah. crazy because I just signed in Adelaide at the sixes. Yeah. There was three pieces of paper. One was to be able to do 25 chin-ups <laughs> <laughs> and 25 dips. <laughs> Were two of my goals. So Why is that so young, stock standard? That's young every Creek, twelve year old boy. Young Creek was not a very uh, out of the box <laughs> dreamer. It was. It was, uh, it was very limited. But what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be able to do chin-ups. The, the third. <laughs> the third thing, which is crazy, was to play for Australia in a World Cup. Now I didn't actually specify what sport. Ah, okay. I knew at that time roughly that it was an all Australian for football, mm-hmm. and I thought that was oh could be an Australian you could play for yeah. Australia, but I then realised it wasn't. 
And that's where I chose basketball because I can't – like playing for the, my country has been the biggest honour, you know, in my life. Yeah. Um, to see people make it now and to try and help people – create a pathway to there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes for the next person to feel what I've felt in my life, to be told what I've told, I've been told and the emotion I've gone through for that. That's why I chose basketball because yeah. I didn't know you could feel all that. I didn't think it was achievable, but for some stupid reason, I was like, oh, I'm going to write that because that makes so much sense. It didn't yeah. make any sense to me. Yep, I didn't yep. even know there was a World Cup yeah. <laughs> for basketball. I didn't really know that there was an Olympics for it because yeah. you never really saw it in a small town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess my focus narrowed there, mm-hmm. but I was playing footy right up until I left for the Institute of Sport. So you sound like a very driven kid, a driven person, but at that time doing so much and being so driven. Did you find that basketball, footy, sport really for you was like something that became your Zen space? Was that something that slowed down your brain in a world where you're on all the time doing all these different things? Was that something that kind of helped you in that way or it kind of made that emotion more, if you know what I'm saying? It it definitely controlled my focus because I could use some of what I had inside. I got picked on at school quite a bit and I Mm -hmm. felt like I was kind of, because I didn't really fit into the groups, I kind of bounced around from the different ones. You kind of got the whispers from other other kids and there were some people that weren't very nice. But I remember just there'd be times where I went home and I didn't want to go to school and- You know, you didn't fit in. You didn't feel like it was a great place to be because you're like, I was dreading recess and I was dreading lunch. And as a kid, you're like, shit, like I, this is school. Like school's yeah. great. Like I look back now and I go, school's the kind of the coolest places you could ever be. Mm. Second now to being in a professional team with your mates, <laughs> yeah. you know, but at the yeah. same time, that's an unrealistic expectation for everybody. Yeah. But it should be something you you do dream for. But yeah, you're right. Like sport became a focus and a singular focus where I could go out, I could be a part of a team and it was the rah, rah, you know, smack each other on the bum in footy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, got your back, got your back, I'm here. Yeah. All those little like moments, it was like, oh, cool. Like actually this guy's got my back a little bit. Yeah. You start to feel like you can generate a bit of that, you know, genuine care from someone else yeah. rather than being someone that's been a giver and trying to look out for people. Yeah. And you're not always perfect. Like not everyone's going to be your best friend. Not everyone loves me and that's fine. I don't care. Like, but you yeah. ask, I am someone that, you know, I want the best for other people and I will give time to anybody. It doesn't matter when, where, what's going on. If I'm going to be late to the next thing, like, you'll get my time. As a kid, I was the same. But yeah, my determination and focus came from, well, actually, there's probably a bit of an incentive. If I do this yeah. team sport, you know, they might actually kind of become my friends and we'll grow this bond together. So I think at the time I didn't realize that. But I knew deep down getting older, that's kind of what it was and what led me to really enjoying team sport. As you stepped into the next phase of your life, like moving to the Institute, were you aware of the mental side that sport had on you yet or it was still something that you were so focused on that it didn't have any negatives? And how was that transition for you being in a country environment where you were able to do so much and you had the support of your family who you were really close with to then going into the env- an environment like the Institute? Well, I, I said no to the Institute first. My parents okay. went through a divorce right probably six months before I, was, I actually went. So we had, I think, an under 18 national championships I did pretty well there and then I was asked to go in and that was, I would have been there for 18 months if I'd gone at that time. And I remember saying no at the time because my parents had just divorced yeah. and split and it was, it was pretty messy at the time and it was, I felt a lot of that kind of pressure and it was probably the first time I'd really understood what mental health kind of was because I was mm-hmm. like, I'm really sad, like yeah. I'm not happy and I don't want to do this. I don't want to go and see my friends. Yeah. And then there was certain contributing factors that kind of limited me from seeing my friends as well. Yeah. So I think when I look at it all, I go, well, the institute came at a good time because it was a distraction from yeah. everything, but I didn't want to leave because I wanted my parents to be happy. I wanted them equally in their own ways, separately to be happy. So when my sister at the time was much older than me, yeah. I was you know, 16 when this happened, she was at university in Melbourne. So she wasn't really there for that. So it was just kind of me and I was the one that kind of found everything out. So yeah. it was a bit of kick in the face for me because I was like, oh, I feel responsible. And I mm-hmm. felt responsible for so long. Yeah. And I never understood why, what, how, why the relationship went that way. I yeah. don't know. And it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was older 
that I understood it. So leaving was like, okay, cool. I can get out of here. Yeah. Great. My parents kind of said to me, look, if you go and you don't enjoy it, you can come back home. Mm -hmm. Door's going to be open for both of it, you know, from both of us and we'll make it work. But if you don't go, you're going to kick yourself. One day there's going to be a point in time and you're going to be like, you know what? I should have gone. I should have given it a crack and I should have seen what it was all about. The best young basketballers, male and female in Australia, all together hooping. Yeah. Like what's, you know, what's not to like, what's not to get better at. And at the time I was addicted to getting better. Yeah. Like I like breaking the game down a little bit, footwork, beating guys one-on-one, playing in a team. So I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. Went there, super positive, had a partner at the time, obviously knew we had to split up. So I was like, all right, that sucks. Got in there and was like, it's going to be great. First three months, I reckon I cried every night on the phone <laughs> to my family. <laughs> I was, I hated it. Like I really hated it. Going from yeah. country to like a university style pressure yeah. environment with the best every day, nutrition, weights, you know, mm. drinking protein powers. I had diarrhea <laughs> for the first six months. I don't know what they put. You, I mean, you got to ask Drimic and Iggy and Hugh Greenwood, yeah, Jackson yeah. Aldridge, all these boys. You got to, whatever was in that protein powder, it was shit house. <laughs> Literally, it was the worst thing in the world. Like, but you go the from being- The sponsor at the time is going to be like, shut oh, up. Oh, man. I was just like, I'm not even going to say who it was. Cause, <laughs> but as a young man- they're like, you got to eat this, you got to do this, mm. you got to do this, you got to go to school first, school comes first. And you're like, I was here for basketball. Like, yeah. if, you don't, if you don't pass school, you don't play basketball. Yeah. And as soon as I fell behind, I went from a private Catholic school in Horsham. Yeah. Shout out St. Bridget's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I went from that to Lake G, public yeah. school, walked in first day, all kind of done up nice, little button up shirts and jeans, realized that everyone's in a, a bluey, you know, trackies and uggies and, and a beanie. And Tang Bali singlet. <laughs> and literally no one paid attention. The teacher's talking and people are on their phone texting. And I was like, this is a culture shock. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah. And for the first week, I was like, I'm going to be really serious. I'm going to do my work. really great. Two weeks in, I was a bag of shit. Like yeah. I, I, I fell behind. I was lazy. Grew all these bad habits. And I was like, this is easy. You know, school's great. Until they're like, well, you're not going to train if your grades do this any longer. Yeah. And then it was like a nip in the butt. Study hall, you know, three, four nights a week. I had to get extra time and tutors, which they all cover, but you you can't replace time. And sitting and doing study hall because you've been numb nuts at school, <laughs> you soon learned that you got to pull your head out and just do the work. And once you've done the work, then it's a little bit of, you know, time for play. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the institute was a rude awakening. <laughs> but I did end up loving it. The yeah. people there became family. The people there became lifelong friends. You know, I'm still very close with quite a few of those guys. I spent some time with Huey Greenwood for after many, many years, you know, um, Drimic and all those, like you just, every time I, I get to see Jackson Aldridge, we haven't seen each other for, year, you know, probably a year now. But before that, there was probably 10 years I went by and I saw him and we went out for dinner in Sydney and it was incredible. Like yesterday, we were in there playing Halo 2 <laughs> on the land connection, just, you know, yelling out in the, yeah. in, the, in the apartment blocks. Like that is just what it's all about. And I finally found friends. Yeah. I, I, it, it felt like I finally found people that were like-minded like me and that was probably one of the most incredible things about the whole journey. Yeah, the special thing about the Institute was that you are around like-minded people. But did you ever have the space to kind of explore yourself outside of that professional high performance area. So when you think about your time at the Institute and all the positives that came out of it, um, do you think that it pigeonholed you a little bit at all? Or were you able to kind of extend, like, as you were talking about your, you know, your love for motorcycles and things like that, were you able to do anything outside of basketball in that time? Not really. <laughs> you're there for school, you, you know, your education and your future education. You're there for development. You're there for learning. And at the same time, you're curious. You're like, well, I'm going through puberty. I'm yeah. becoming a man. Like, yeah. oh, that girl's pretty attractive. Yeah. Like, oh, I like this. I like that. And then you're like, oh, I don't really get to have the things that I have back home because I'm living in a tiny apartment with six other people and yeah. a one door joining between us <laughs> with another six people, yeah. which was always open. So, there yeah. was, I was living with 12 people. Yeah. And you kind of get trapped in the... I'm in a routine and the yeah. routine's fantastic because it teaches you development Yeah, and you're kind of forced to learn how to develop yeah. at an efficient rate and effectively. But sometimes when you kind of get given something pretty easily, 
you can sometimes fumble it a little bit and yeah. it becomes very easy. So, you just think it always comes easy. Yeah. And I fell into that trap a little bit. But then when you go away from it and you go, well, okay, I need to go do something else because this is driving me nuts. You're like, what do you do? You used to go to the Belco Mall yeah. and you get Donut King <laughs> yeah. at 8 o'clock at night because they close on a Friday and we'd go there and try and get cheap donuts yeah. because they were closed until the next morning. You go to EB Games and buy games and you go and play some Xbox or PlayStation, whatever it is. But, you know, it wasn't until I got to 17 and I was able to get a car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, the first car. That game was, changing. Game oh, <laughs> used to hang the keys up, charge five bucks for people to use the car. Yes. Um, you know, you, you have these moments. And it was cool because I was yeah. like, sweet, mechanical. Like, I love this. Like, when I was back in school, I dropped out for six months. And I went and did, you know, you know six months of diesel, uh, diesel mechanic. Like I did cool. a TAFE course. Yeah. But then when I realized I was going back to the institute, well, mum and dad are like, we well, better get, go back to school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can't do my TAFE course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so cars, bikes, anything with an engine, I was just like, oh, this is cool. Like let's do some handbrakes, like yeah. whatever it is. So um, you are limited. And then obviously when you get to 18, you have a bit of freedom to, you know, you can go out and have a beer with your friends. You yeah. can go out and go, you know, on flights and do all these other things and you can kind of experience new things, buy new things. But realistically, as a young boy, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I was just living with my mates and yeah. kind of having a good old time doing that. Yeah. So, where did the decision for you come not to go to the college route and to go straight into like the professional sports arena and kind of inject yourself straight into that how did that kind of all unfold marty clark was my head coach paul gross was an assistant yeah um adam caporn was there um now all people in different roles in the world which is really amazing but i remember it came to uh the college and i, I went away under 18 worlds yep. at albert Schweitzer. we won the tournament gold medalist i was an mvp of the tournament and then it was like i'd never had any attention ever yeah and it was all of a sudden like colleges were like kind of calling you get an email and they get funneled through the institute. And I remember like hearing like, oh, like agents were like wanting to talk and you're like, what, what do I need an agent for? Yeah. And it never really hit me until probably like six months before I left the shoot that yeah. I could actually play professional one day. Maybe. Huh. Like yeah. it, I, did, I never had like the real inner belief that I could be – x i just was like oh cool this is pretty fun like yeah. i'm a kid like this yeah. is really sweet there's you know 400 males and there's 400 females yeah. in a 100 meter radius yeah. and we're all playing sport like yeah. this is sick <laughs> like life's pretty good i got free food free yeah. internet mm -hmm. my boys yeah. um and then yeah it's like oh i've got to be an adult yeah and if i went to college the one thing i hated was when i first started to get recruited everyone told me how good i was yeah and i I just hated it. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate being told, oh, you're really good at basketball. Mm -hmm. It makes me like really not like somebody. Yeah. Like I want to like if someone really, man, oh, I'm so love your game. You're the best. Oh, you man. I just want to like grab his mouth and be like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. <laughs> like just tell me a moment that you enjoy yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. reiterate, mate, it was incredible. Were you yeah. there? It was great. How's yeah. the family? Did the kids come? But no, like they were like, you're amazing. You could do this. You'd be this. And I was like, I don't want that. Yeah. Marty Clark goes from the Institute, goes to Adelaide 36ers. They sign a team. Nathan Herbert does his knee. Mm -hmm. About a month before that, Marty goes, hey, stay at the shoot another six months. Come in preseason. I'll sign you on three-year deal. Sweet. Cool. What am I going to get out of it? We're going to get better. You suck at this, this, this. You need to get better at this, this, this. You're great at this, this, this. But this is where we're going. I was like, cool, done. I'm in. A month later, Nathan Herbert does his knee. Uh, unfortunately, that's where it kind of wrapped that up for him and mm -hmm. my opportunity came like that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it was just like, well, now I'm professional. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like when I became a pro, I thought I was an MVP of a World Cup to the man. Mm -hmm. Oh, how it was not right. <laughs> that was so far from the truth. All right. So, Adelaide, you get there. It's your first professional experience. You, for this last little bit, you sound like you're just flying high. Things are just coming your way and um, you're handling it pretty well. It, at what point in this professional block of your life did things start to get, oh, it's actually not all high sailing all the time? Oh, yeah, that, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> My first paycheck. Yeah. Well, I now this is the, the funny misconception is people look at even me now and they go, oh, 
oh, like you've just always done this. You've yeah. always made like good money. You've been a franchise guy. Like that's just how you've always been. You yeah. know, go Mitch. Well, you have no idea how yeah. different it was. And it's different for me as it is for you. Yeah. But people don't understand how hard it is sometimes. And when the expectation is you become a pro, you think sick. People say, I can get the bag. I can get yeah. the money. Like I'm going to be good. Like whatever. Well, I'll tell you what. My first contract was $32,000 yeah. as a pro. Yeah. Like I was an MVP of world, like world championship and I was like third minimum wage mm-hmm. in the NBL at the time. Yeah. My next two paychecks after that for my first year deal were like not even like like under 50K pretty much. Yeah. Like I wasn't making any money. Yeah. Like I was a, a 18-year-old child, mm-hmm. <laughs> literally a child, that had no idea of what life was. And when I first got my paycheck, I thought I was the king. I was like <laughs> sick. I saw like four grand or five grand coming to my, my yeah. pay and I was like, this is dope. Like yeah. how great. Well, I forgot that uh, in life you have uh, rent, bond, bills, mm-hmm. insurance, car, health, private, everything, mm. uh, ambulance cover. You have life, home and content insurance, yep. all that kind of stuff. And that's just all the eyes. You then have some other letters like food, <laughs> um, bedding, yeah. TV, mm-hmm. couch, mm-hmm. car. Yeah. Forgot that. Uh, yeah. First thing I bought was my house, like yeah. stuff in the house, not yeah. a house. Uh, and then I realized I had uh, $800 left <laughs> and I spent 3000 I'm probably like 90% of my money in like 48 hours. Like it was gone. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit, where's the rest of it? Like, is there more? Is this weekly? Didn't ask. Now, this is monthly. And I was like, oh, my God, like, (laughs) I'm in trouble. I ended up getting money forwarded for my future months. Yeah. Um, I had a car payment, which was coming in the second month to get a car. I bought Mm -hmm. a car. Now, instead of buying a $1,000 car uh, with my $5,000 car payment, I bought a $5,000 car (laughs) because I'm a dickhead. (laughs) And against all advice, I – like, put it this way. When I was at the Institute, I bought a car. It was $150. We bought it from the tip. Nice. nice. It was a Ford Laser 1984, I think it was. Mm. Uh, four-door laser, red, no mirrors, no wipers, mm-hmm. overheated regularly on the way to Belco Mall. Yeah. Um, all the boys can attest to how shit house my car was. <laughs> yes. um, but I went and should have bought a very simple car. Mitchell yeah. did not. Mm-hmm. That was my rude awakening to be professional because I realized that as much as I'm a professional, I am so small yeah. and the world's so big yeah. and I had no idea about life. I'd been taught how to be a student. Mm-hmm. I'd been taught how to be a basketballer to some extent. I walked in and my first day of practice, I felt like the court was six feet high mm-hmm. and I watched Adam Mellinger and Jacob Holmes shoot corner threes just hot, like yeah. spooly cack mm-hmm. and they did not miss. And I was like, I can't even fucking shoot. <laughs> like I suck I could not shoot if yeah. you watched me my first five years I was the most inconsistent shooter you've ever seen in your entire life yeah and some people go oh you still suck and I'm like yeah well come challenge me now and I'll kick <laughs> yeah. your ass. Yeah. but the thing is back then I was genuinely crap yeah like I was a terrible shooter mm. I was known to be an athlete to work hard and to play defense and that was it yeah that was all I did so I walked into my first couple of practices I got dunked on I was getting bullied like I thought I was a pretty athletic you know, could go. I just got my ass torn up. Like it was bad. Like it was so bad. And then you get paid and then you just waste your money on dumb shit. Yeah. And I was like, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Like I thought I was pretty good and I felt like an absolute goose. Do you think as athletes we get let down in that transition transition phase? Like there should be some sort of role for someone to kind of help you like climatize to the situation that you're being put in especially as a young athlete coming out of maybe it's the institute maybe it's college whatever it is someone to teach you life and not just the financial side and like how to buy cleaning supplies but the um hey you're stepping into your first professional gig it's going to be difficult for these reasons like a mentor of such in every team i definitely think it's probably the most undervalued and least utilized thing that we could have. Um, we had a, a meeting a couple of weeks or a week or two ago from one of our sponsors mm-hmm. um, and incredible that they did this, but it was a bit of an education session of you're a professional now, what can you do with your money? Yeah. But I then went and spoke to some of the young guys and as soon as they come in, I'll be the first person every single year to be like, what do you need? Like I helped one of the guys buy a car this year. I paid for the car in mm-hmm. full for him and I said, let's put on a payment plan because let's not 
stuff your money up yeah. like I did. Yeah. You know, you help people because I genuinely feel like they're not guided in the right direction. Have yeah. you done your insurance yet? No. Oh, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Are you going to drive the car? Yes. I'll, we'll do the insurance now <laughs> before you drive the car. Oh, yeah, no worries. All good. And I literally had to call that person three times. And yeah. if they're listening, I'm not going to use your name. <laughs> <laughs> but I literally had to call. And I was like, you need to call this number. Yeah. You use this policy number yeah and sign up and get full comprehensive insurance right now yeah so before you do anything else i said do not drive that car yeah or i will actually chin you <laughs> <laughs> and he, he turned around and was like man like it was actually so easy it took two minutes and i was like yeah great i said because if you have an accident this is what happens you're liable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're liable for their life if you you know touch wood that nothing bad happens but if someone ever has an accident with no insurance you're liable for their life and you yeah. have to like that. it's a millions and millions of dollars yeah i had no idea of this yeah. i had third party insurance for the first five years <laughs> i crashed a car and i lost twenty thousand dollars yeah i worked my ass off for a car yeah i paid about four grand off lost the other 16. yeah biggest lesson i ever learned yeah was to be an adult and i never know never knew how to do it so just to be able to talk about tax how to save what a trust is. If you're going to buy a property, put it in a trust. Yeah. So if anything happens to you, your property doesn't go under. Yeah. Can't touch you. Yeah. Most people probably don't even know that. If you don't know that, you should learn it. Yeah. I feel like an idiot trying to be told this and like, how does this work? It's too hard. Oh, I don't want to do this. I just want to play basketball. Yeah. Would you want to, do you want to have a family? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to have kids? Yes. Do they want to have a house? Do they want to have food on the table? Well, how do you do that? Yeah. And that's what I'm starting to learn now. And I spoke about before, like, I've just finished designing a booklet that is completely based around nothing physical in sport. It's all the mental. Mental. Mm -hmm. And you need to learn that. Just sleep, eat, nutrition, habits, breathing, controlling stress, anxiety, depression, Mm -hmm. all these things. But then being aware of what are those things? What trigger those things? How do you plan for those things? Writing stuff down, setting goals, implementing them, daily routine. Seems like a lot of things, but it's pretty simple when I've got it in a booklet. Yeah. And then yeah. you learn that. And then the next step is going to be life. Yeah. And that's what it's going to be called. The next booklet will be life. <laughs> the book of life. And by it's Mitch just Craig. like the, 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 yeah. the, the mistakes I made that I hope you don't yeah. will be the cast line. Yeah. So uh, I'd love I'd love for a role to be in. Like, and I know the Play Association do a great job of putting their hand up if you want to be there. But yeah. I think every team should have somebody that just is there and goes, mm. hey, newbies, come in here. Put some firewood down. Let's have a little campfire and let's talk about life, boys. Because you're gonna, it's you about got to, get to root, real. yeah, you've got to really get into it. And yeah, I think it's, it's big time. The main difference in that space for men's basketball and women's basketball is when we get thrown into it. It's here's a professional career. You also have to work full time. And so where I see the gaps being in those spaces is we're forced that life piece on us a little bit faster Um, because, I mean, I know when my first year as a professional, I thought it was going to be, oh, you just play basketball. But it was like, oh, you just play basketball and and here's a full-time job and also study full-time at the same time. So I think that there, as as much as that's a great thing because it gives you the life skills, there needs to be someone there to kind of funnel you in the right direction and talk to you about the things that matter did you have someone on that Adelaide team that helped you in the way that you help other people now in that life piece or it was more of like a fail, learn, fail, learn, fail, learn? I uh, did a little bit but not a lot. Mm-hmm. Like there wasn't – I didn't feel – like I really try and make sure like when the imports come in, first thing I do, like if you're here, let's go get a meal, let's go have a few beers. Mm-hmm. Loosen you up with a few beers. Yeah. We start talking, talking a bit of shit. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the night, we've gone out. We've had a bit of fun. We've enjoyed each other's company. The next day, we go into training and we're at it. And it's like, holy shit, you've gone from one extreme to another. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, like if, if you're not aware that what's to come, you know, the first thing is, is like, this is Australia. This yeah. is different. Yeah. Like they need to know what's different. They need to know that you got to be careful of these things. Yeah. You have to be careful of those things. Mm-hmm. This is really good. This is really good. Yeah. And you've kind of got to walk them through it. And they'll sometimes be like, yeah, great, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. 
and they still walk into it. You're like, that room's on fire. That handle's hot. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, right. Oh, cool. Thanks, Continue man. Appreciate it. To burn you leave. Hands. And then they yeah. hold it. And they're like, that's really hot. Yeah. I should let go. Then they grab with two hands. Yeah. <laughs> and that you've, see, you've seen it. Yeah. Like, it happens all the time. Yeah. So, I think, and I, don't, I, I can't speak for women's basketball. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a woman. Yeah. Um, but what I find is so many people in men's basketball – they don't know how to speak to the media. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to run a social media. They mm-hmm. don't know how to speak to fans. They don't know how to engage truly after a game and give genuine time. Mm-hmm. Genuine time and genuine care are two different things. Mm-hmm. And giving time and giving care are two different things again to those two things. Because you can give time. You can give five minutes after a game. Yeah. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. You can go in. Yeah, great. Hey, thanks, mate. Thanks for the photo. No worries. But you can walk around for half an hour. You walk around for 45 minutes. Lauren Jackson, I'm not sure. I remember hearing, I don't know if it's true or not, after her first game, walked around for an hour. Yep, that's true. I reckon it was longer. And I I, I, I've longer. done that yeah. so many times. Yeah. And the amount of messages that I got that I hadn't opened in the request or mm-hmm. the other area you don't see sometimes. Oh, my God, thank you so much for waiting. We waited for an hour. You know, we stood in line and waited for you for an hour. Now, if that doesn't actually wake you up and slap you in the face- yeah. You're an idiot. Yeah. Like you don't understand the impression you can have on somebody and the absolute life-changing sequence of moments that will go, I want to be like him. I want to be like Annalie Maley because she waited for me. Yeah. That's all. In her mind now, she's now the next Lauren Jackson. She's the next mate. She's whatever it is. Yeah. And it's happened so many times where I walk around even after these games and I'm getting ushered out by security and I get so lippy to the security <laughs> and I've had to go into a press conference and I told the fans, I said, if you guys leave, I won't stand here next week and sign anything. Yeah. Don't leave. Mm-hmm. And the security, I got called and they're like, you can't tell people that. Like, yeah. <laughs> you got to stop. There's actually rules. We'll get in trouble. Um, yeah. But you don't want them to leave because you're like, I have to go and do this, but I want you to have a moment and mm-hmm. I want you to have the understanding that we are not bigger than the game and we are not mm-hmm. bigger than anyone else. Like those moments are what people don't understand. And when people just go in, go to the change room, talk shit, go home, have a few beers, go out, whatever they want, Mm. go home to their partners or whatever it is, they go home to that. But they don't realize they just left 10,000 fans out there who go, I just paid like good money tonight. Yeah. Food, travel, parking, expenses, gear. I got membership. I bought some friends. I told my sponsors friends. And this guy just, he just left. Yeah. Like he won and he just left. He lost and he's still here 45 minutes later. I want to sign with that club. Yeah. I want to sponsor that guy. Yeah. I've had hundreds of opportunities from just to being like, I enjoy it. I love yeah. talking to kids and talking shit and yeah. having fun and signing their head. And, you know, he had my <laughs> shoes, like have a shoe. Yeah. I got more. So I got sponsored by Puma. Shout out Puma. Like, yeah. keep giving me shoes. And the yeah. guy's like, man, these guys got like 400 pairs of shoes. Yeah. I don't have any. I yeah. give them away every game. Yeah. Because someone now puts it on their shelf and goes, I'm going to do that one day. That's going to be me. And if you can have that effect on one person, you've done your job. But people don't understand how important it is. So, the next generation, me, I didn't know. Yeah. The next person doesn't really know either. But if I can lead by example, that's how you do it. Yeah. I'm not perfect, never claim to be, but I try and give perfect effort. And if I can continue to do that and instill that in others, well, then I've, I've done a little bit of positive in my time playing basketball. Did you always want to be a role model? Like, is that something that it, you thought about? Like, I want to be this person for these younger kids. Or as time went on, it just happened. How did that, when did you realize that, oh my God, these people are looking up to me? And did that ever feel like weighted or was it always like a privilege, I guess? It's hard to, to put a time on it, but you don't realize it until one day you're like, this person wants me to sign their shirt. Yeah. Like, cool. And then they're like, oh, my God, Mitch, like, we love this. And you're like, wow, you actually know that about me. Like, yeah. that's crazy. Then you ask about them. Then you see them in another game. Then you see them at the the event we have out in Traralgon. Yeah. And then you see them in the city the next day. And you're like, these people are everywhere. Yeah. Like, they know. And I started to pick that up in Adelaide a little bit. Mm-hmm. But then it wasn't really until probably my fourth or fifth year where it was like people appreciated how I played. But then there was also the other side of it. Like yeah. people don't appreciate some things you can't do and you're not able to do just yet. Mm-hmm. But you realize that you have that effect on people and you're like, I'm becoming a bit of a role model. And you don't know until 
you take over Adelaide 36's social media <laughs> and uh, there's a game that goes to overtime and Anthony Petrie hits a three and I'm like, uh, hell yeah, bitches, <laughs> on the social media and I got a call <laughs> <laughs> and realized it was not the right thing to say and wow, it was very yeah, derogatory and I should not have said that. And yeah, uh, yeah Mitch, Mitch learned a lesson. So. Yeah, Mitch learned something. Yeah, but you know, like I've made that many mistakes mm. and it's okay. I, like I, I've, I've written stuff on social media that I've gone, I should not have put it out there. Mm-hmm. That's actually illegal if I did that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, hey, like I've got a speeding fine. Imagine yeah. if someone took my points. Woo. Yeah. And I'm like, that's really stupid. Take it down. They yeah. took it down. It already been screenshotted, sent to Channel 7. This mm-hmm. was years and years ago. Yeah. And then the next day, I've got the club being called and Joey Wright like, what the hell are you doing, you dickhead? Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, I was joking. Like, yeah. I didn't really mean it. Yeah. And in the back of mine, I'm like, but if someone messaged me, maybe yeah. I would probably, <laughs> I would probably, I would do, probably it. do that, yeah. you know? So mm-hmm. you make these mistakes, mm-hmm. but along the, lay, along the way, mm-hmm. you realize that, well, this lady's just gone, my kids look up to you. Yeah. You need to be a better role model. And you're like, holy shit. Wow. I yeah. didn't choose this. I'm just being me. Yeah. You know, I'm not perfect. I've said it time and time again. I'll always say it. But I try and be a good person and I try and have a good time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being authentic and being yourself and having a good time gets you in a bit of mud. Yeah. And that's okay. But at the same time, if I'm not my authentic self, then you kind of just, you're wasting your time. Like I enjoy signing. I enjoy post-game stuff with fans. I Mm -hmm. enjoy having the conversation. People go, oh, but that was tough to get through. And you're like, it wasn't. Yeah. It really wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had conversations where you're like, I never thought I'd hear that from that person. Mm -hmm. But thank you. And then someone else hears it and they're like, oh, that's a bit awkward. Like, you know, that's a bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, excuse me, that's our conversation. We can have a conversation afterwards, but please respect their privacy because when someone pulls me aside and wants to have a conversation, I would think that you would want the privacy as well. Exactly. And it's just understanding that now you are an influencer, you are a role model, you are someone that people look up to, Mm -hmm. anything you do and say- essentially, you know, can be used against you. Like, yeah. it's just like yeah. you can't, you've got to be careful. Yeah. Like social media, mm-hmm. like it's a huge pit hole yeah. for people now. It's a trap. It it's is a, a trap. trap. <laughs> yeah. So, I, as you transitioned from the NBL, you then took a big step into the NBA. And I know that um, you had a very successful time in the NBL. What was it like for you mentally to then step from this you know, role model in an Australian basketball bubble and then all of a sudden you're catapulted into, you know, the NBA, which is massive and huge for you. What was that like for your soul, your psyche, your person, your sense of self? Tell me about that. Well, I I signed in Germany. I played a season, like a half, like an end of a season and then I re-signed with a team called Würzburg. Mm-hmm. Came back home for two weeks. In that two-week period, I had got a call and it was like, we want you to do an Exhibit 10 contract. Come to training camp. You can make a little bit, a tiny bit of money, like max is 50K. Normally, people get like 10, 15 grand. And then if you don't make the team, then you'll play in the G League, mm-hmm. which is like $30,000. Yeah. And I was like, well, I've just become like a, an MVP of Adelaide. Like mm-hmm. I just signed in Germany. Like this is like my first big paycheck. I was like, this is sick. Yeah. And then you're like, I'm going to turn it all away for an opportunity to potentially play Maybe. in the NBA. Yeah. Kind of not. Mm-hmm. And I was like, my family's not well off. Like, yeah. you know, the, my dad was a builder and, you know, it's like, oh, it's really cool. But it's like he worked his ass off his entire life. And mm-hmm. I can happily say, like, I'm able to now provide for them yeah. because they weren't always able to – you know, they gave us so much. They yeah. took so much from themselves. Yeah, took away from themselves. You know, so you, you, you look at it and you're like, well, this is a big decision. Mm-hmm. Do I go to Germany and you make probably a month what you're going to make over seven months? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that's a big difference. And I was like, I could buy my mum a car. I could buy my dad a house. He doesn't yeah. own a house at the moment. Like, my yeah. mum does when they split. Like, but that's it. Like, I bought my mum a car and, it, like, that was the most incredible thing I've ever been able to do. Yeah. Take the load off. Do something for someone else in your family that gave you so much. Like, yeah. no, like it was just, it was crazy to be like, I'm in this situation. Like, I've got all the potential to make good financial decisions for myself and my family. Yeah. Or I can go to the NBA and try and just m- maybe make it. Yeah. And I went to the NBA. I tried to go in. Didn't do a phenomenal camp. Like, I was solid. Did had good moments and stuff like that. But I just. 
I didn't do enough to get picked up. And then um, I went to the G League and then I probably played there for five, four or five months. And for the first two months, we talked about 10-day contracts. You get mm-hmm. a 10-day contract, you get a bit of money. Like yeah. it's pretty cool. Everyone knows it, all these numbers online. I'm not saying it for any other reason, but it's a huge decision to be like, I'm going to just not go to Europe. And yeah. everyone knows you do well in Europe, you double your money the next next year. Yeah. It's just how it goes. Yeah. You be a good, consistent player, you can triple your money. Like it's it's really Important. a good place yeah. to go and play and do well. Mm-hmm. And I just remember going and thinking like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this. I'm going to really give it everything. And I did not understand how hard it was going to be. Like mm-hmm. it was so brutal. Yeah. New York, like winter was fucked. I'm sorry. <laughs> Blistering but it was so cold. So cold. Blistering cold. So cold. And then mm-hmm. you go into, you know, not making the NBA team. You then go to the G League. And then it was like you're living in a literally an old Hilton suite. So like the burgundy red with <laughs> brown and your nana's yeah. carpet. Like yeah. that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And it was bleak. Yeah. And we were an hour and a half, two hours out of, you know, Manhattan. You weren't in Brooklyn or New York. Yeah. You weren't living the high life. You're making bugger all money. Mm-hmm. You're getting driven into the ground. You're playing every two days, three days. And then the thing was, because I did the camp and stuff, I was like the injury guy for them to go and play against. Like I had like Kenneth Fareed, La- uh, Karis LeVert, mm-hmm. Spencer Dimwitty, mm-hmm. like Jared Dutt, like – Big time players yeah. who I would like come in and work out against yeah. sometimes in the morning. And then I'd come back on a two hour, you know, private car from the Nets in yeah. this big Escalade and they'd drop me back at practice. And I'd train with the Long Island Nets. Yeah. And it was brutal. And there yeah. was just moments where you're like, I hope I get a 10 day. I hope I get a 10 day. They're like, yeah, you're going to get one. You're going to get one. You're going to get one. It's coming. It's coming. And then two months, three months, four months, five months. And I was like, what, what am I doing? Yeah. Like, I could be providing for my family and I was so miserable. I was so depressed. Like, it was bad. It was rough. I learned the piano. That's how bad it was. There like, you go. My mom was a concert <laughs> pianist and I was like, yeah. I need to do something that reminds me of home. So, I bought yeah. a keyboard. I started learning how to play and I played mom's favorite songs and then, like, video her and play the songs to her. And it's funny because I still have the videos of me learning and I'm freaking shit out. You're terrible. I was so bad. I was like, yeah. you know, trying to bloody whack a cat with a hammer. Like yeah. it didn't sound good. So I, I finally like made the call to my agent. I said, hey, I want to go to Europe. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And then we told the team, we're like, hey, like if, if we're not going to get one, that's fine. Yeah. But we can still go to Europe and play three months and then transition that into the following year. Yeah. Like if he's not good enough, it's okay. Yeah. And they actually doubled down like a week later. I got a call and it's like, hey, you've, you're getting a 10-day contract. You're going to play for, you know, for the Brooklyn Nets. And I just like I was in such a bad place mm. that I didn't even know if it was like the right thing to do. Like that's how bad my, my yeah. mind was playing tricks on me. It was yeah. like I cried like Im- immense te- Like I've never sobbed so much in my life like mm-hmm. – it was a culmination of life's works and life's work and negativities and hate and mm. comments about you can't shoot, you can't do this, you're a bad player, you're a bad person, you know, you, you're this. And you get it so much. And unfortunately, as athletes, you get 95 or 90% good, 10% bad, but you yeah. listen to the bad. You because listen to the bad. The bad's what we're kind of taught to be more in tune to. And sometimes, you know, I was like, maybe the bad is correct. Maybe I'm not good enough. And yeah. for a long time in America, I was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to make it. Like, this is really brutal. I'm playing pretty well, but there's other guys and I'm just not good enough. Like, yeah. And then it was like, I want to come home and I don't want to do this. And then you get the call and it was just like, holy shit. Like, yeah. tomorrow, it was a Sunday night. We were going on an LA swing on in the G League, like 11 games in 14 days or something stupid. Oh, God. And then I didn't have to go on that, thank gosh. But uh <laughs> Yeah, I, the next day I suited up and I, I just remember calling my family and I just couldn't get the words out. I was just yeah. bawling. Like, they must have thought I got my legs ran over. <laughs> and I just was so, so emotional. Like, yeah. Like, it was just, you can't even describe it. Like, and then to go out and play, mm-hmm. like, the first game, they're just like, yeah, you're not going to play. And you're like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, this is sick. <laughs> this is I'm on awesome. the NBA team. Yeah. Like, who cares what happens? Yeah. Like, yeah. no one can ever take that from me. No yeah. matter what you tell me in my life, whatever happens, I get to hang on to that. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's something that not many people get to do. But it was certainly as equally rewarding. It was 5, 10, 20 times as hard and I really, really went through it to try and get to where I wanted to get to. 
that um, when you talk about being low and um, that you were depressed and going straight from that really low emotional space to then being rocketed up to such a high space, what was the bounce back like after that? So you're, you're, you're low, you bounce straight up to this super high ride and how long did you stay up there and did you at any point level out or would, was it like a hard fall to come back to reality? It was tough because you go on these road trips, you go on these games. And the first night I was, I went in, I got subbed in by the other coach and I was just sitting there like, oh, this is amazing. And then they end up pointing to you, you go in, you make a free throw, everyone goes bananas. And the world back home is talking about, oh, he got subbed in off someone else getting fouled and injured and he gets made, he made one or two. Like, how good is this? And the next night you go and play in TD Garden, Boston, you're playing against Bainesy, Tatum, Brown, all these guys, Marcus Smart. You go out, you have half a dozen points, a couple of rebounds, and you're playing against Giannis. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, holy shit. Like, yeah. we've got the Greek god. Like, this yeah. is bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. Although he blocked me, I think, my first play. Like, yeah. you get a floater on him, you throw a behind the back pass in transition. You're like, this is it. Like, you can't get any higher than this. Mm-hmm. And you're right. I was like, I got to pull my head in because mm-hmm. I got so far kind of ahead of like, this is life, this is expectation. And I was like, this isn't. This is fake. Mm-hmm. Like, people are getting paid. $30 million a year to be ballers and this it's not real. Like yeah. I am a country boy and we make nothing. We have nothing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean we are anything. It doesn't mean we're nothing, but it just means we have to be humble of our beginnings. And for me, it was the hardest thing to try and bounce back from because I had to kind of keep it in check, but it was really hard to kind of, you know, adjust after it all kind of finished. So being in the big time and being surrounded by all these really high profile people and, you kind of touched on it just before, like you are a country boy at heart. And um, what was your sense of self like, your like your identity, you know, how you identify and, and, you know, your connection with your family and all the things that make you, you. How did you maintain that at that level, being surrounded by those types of people 24-7? I think my accent was the first thing that (laughs) kind of helped me because – Everywhere you go, everyone asks, oh, you're Aussie. You're like, yeah. yeah, brother. Yeah. How good is this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I love to come to Australia. Man, and then instantly I had it just like a bang. It was just like, oh, yeah. Australia's this, this, and this. How yeah. good? Like, you know, back home, it's crazy. It's unreal. And you're like, man, I miss it. Like, it's – that's that's home, yeah. you know. And I remember like I got this tattoo because this reminds me of – have a little basketball hoop in the back of like a forest and the back of the mountains and where we used to live, one of my favourite memories of home was we had four or five acres and it was just this beautiful little setting and out on the front porch you could see Mount Arapiles just in the distance and it was just like... Unreal. That's like, for me, that was the biggest reminder. It was just waking up and seeing the car drive past, the birds would fly off and then that's why I've got the birds flying here with the mountains and you just think about like all the memories... Mm. And that's all I ever went back to was the memories, getting ice cream at Hall's Gap. Well, you know, that was like the coolest thing in the world. Let's go to Hall's Gap so we can get ice cream from that place. Yeah. Like I think about those memories as a family. And when we're all together, the last times we were together as a family, like everyone, mm-hmm. that's what I think of. Yeah. And that for me is like beyond – you couldn't pay me enough money to forget about that. Yeah. Because I wouldn't go and be – you know, this without that. Yeah. So that would come with me. And if I, if I can't have them with me, I wouldn't have it. Like I'd, I'd give it all away. Like I would literally give up everything I ever own and will own for my family to be comfortable. Yeah. Not well off, not anything else, but comfortable and happy because that's all we all want. Yeah. And being over there was tough because, yeah, you got all these glitz and glams and big money and private jets and, you know, fancy hotels and, People talking about, you know, promo doing a promo for like a hundred grand and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> that <laughs> is just beyond just my just level of comprehension. Like it's actually, but yeah. yeah, it's just some yeah. of the things I saw, like you sit there and I felt uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I really felt uncomfortable sometimes. Sometimes you're just like, this is sick. Like, yeah. how good I just met Jay-Z or Meek Mill. Like, you know, <laughs> this is mad. Like I saw Obama, like he said, Get, like, you're like, this is mad. Yeah. But then you're like in other scenarios, you're just like, I, do, I don't want to be here. Yeah. Like I feel so out of place. Yeah. And I don't feel comfortable within myself to be here and to pretend like I belong here. Yeah. And I know that I, I don't want millions and millions and millions of dollars because yeah. it's, it's not going to make me happy. Yeah. Like it will never make me happy. But like the little things that money can't buy, quality time with friends and family, 
you know, common interests, peace and quiet, you know, countryside, like, like you said before, like the bikes and, you know, just being with, you know, in, in areas where you feel comfortable, that's worth everything. It's, there's no value you can put on it that would change what I want out of it more than being over there and realizing this isn't where I want to be for the rest of my life, but this helps me allow my family to make choice, like choices, to mm. allow them to have the freedom to maybe, you know what, it's okay if I, I buy that nice shirt for a change. Yeah. Because we never did that. Like, you yeah. just, you know, you, instead of going to Macca's or to the fish and chip shop for your nice meal out for the week or your takeaway, you'd go to a, a nice restaurant, have a nice steak. Someone else cooks for you rather than, you know, going and buying a cheaper cut and just cooking at home on the Barbie. But the Barbie was, that's what makes it. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you think about the times and you're yeah. like, I'd rather be at a barbecue with friends than to go out to a meat and wine co. Yeah. There's no disrespect to Meat and Wine Co. I love Meat love and Wine them. Co. Love them. Massive shout yeah. out Meat and Wine Co. <laughs> you know, hook us up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you just, you know, you got to remember where you came from and you got to remember what's right for you. Mm. And not everything that's, you know, got glitter and gold on it's good for you. Sometimes it's there to distract you and to tempt you. And then behind that is something that's not good. And you don't realize it until you go and play with it and try it and you go, actually, that was really bad for me. Some people never realize that. And they end up bankrupt or they end up in, you know, positions that, you know, leave them less favorable. Yeah. So, after your time in the NBA and uh, transitioning back towards the NBL, how has these last couple of years been for you adjusting to, you know, this next part of your career? Like what was it like coming back from the NBA and then, you know, being the player for Southeast Melbourne Phoenix and being the man? What what does that feel like in terms of like the way you view yourself? It was a culture shock like I'd never thought because when the team first started, not many people know this, but when Southeast first started, it had the owner, had Tommy Greer, and then I got signed. So before Simon Mitchell came in, mm -hmm. I was signed. Now, whether that's common knowledge or not, I don't know. I don't really care. But that's what happened. I met Simon and I was just like, cool, we're going to do this. Like, sick, no worries. Now, people think I went to the NBA, right, and I didn't play a lot. I went and got fully signed by Minnesota and there was, I think, eight games left in that season. They had to, make, had to win 10 games to make the finals. Um, so they couldn't make it. I was told that, you're going to play pretty much every game. We're going to throw you in. We're going to see what you can do. Like, let's go. I didn't play any of the games. The very last game of the season, I played like five minutes. That was it. So, I've gone and done G League. Yep. I was probably the seventh best player on that team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you just, you, you think about it and you're like, I didn't really play in Brooklyn a whole bunch. I played like 12, 15 minutes. Yeah, you get a few points, you get a few rebounds, but you're not the man. Mm -hmm. You're like... The, the man who walks his dog on a lead <laughs> and you're not even the dog. You're the little teddy that the dog sleeps with. Like yeah. that's how you feel sometimes. Yeah. You're like, cool. I'm yeah. going to just, you know, guard Giannis under the combo. And you're like, <laughs> I don't belong here. But this yeah. is like, I actually do belong here. And you're yeah. like, this is really cool. Mm. And then it's like, oh, you're back on the bench and you don't play for four days or five games or whatever mm. it is. And then you go to another team and you don't play for eight games. And you're like, well, cool. Like hopefully – the trust I have within myself and the belief I have is enough for a, a franchise to sign me. Mm -hmm. So they sign you and you come back and all of a sudden it's just like you, you haven't played. Mm. I hadn't played 35 minutes. Mm. Like I averaged 33 minutes a game or whatever the last four years, like 33, 35 minutes a game. I hadn't played 33 minutes in five games, let alone that every week. So I had to come back into a team and it was like, I remember Melbourne game one, like we beat them and I, I played really well and whatever else. I pulled that shit at my ass. <laughs> I literally like, I'd, I'd barely trained with the team leading mm. up to it. I'd done a couple of weeks or whatever else, but I was like, I didn't do a lot. Mm. And I just kind of came in off the NBA just like, oh, well, it's cool. I'm just going to be super confident in myself. And everyone's giving me all this confidence not to get too high, not to get too low. Mm. But I got high enough to where I'm like, this is a safe medium for me to be at. I can play at the NBA, I'm going to get back there. Like basically it was a fuck you to everyone who didn't sign me Yeah, because I believed I can help an NBA team. 
I yeah. can help with culture. I can help with the people. I can help with the young guys. I can help win games right now. So at the time, it was like, you know what? I'm good enough. Like, let's go out and, and show these people. Everyone in the world, you know, that's that was what I wanted to prove. And I came in that first game and it kind of just, I started there and I was like, shit, if I can do it one game, I can do it every goddamn game. Mm -hmm. And that's the belief that I told myself that if you can be a star once, you can be a star every day. It's only that we tell ourselves that consistency is inconsistent. Mm. It's not true. Consistently show up, put in the work, put in the time, put in the effort, sacrifice, give to others, be a good person, work your fucking ass off. Don't make excuses for yourself or anyone else and go out and be a star. Be consistent. So I was like, I'm going to be that person. And it's not always going to be scoring. It's not always going to be, you know, anything of the face or whatever. It was just like, let's just go and be a good person and work our ass off and see what happens. Played the first game, did really well. And I was like, that's the benchmark. Mm -hmm. That's a freaking high benchmark that game. Like it was big shots, big plays, big moments, defensive stops, like team chemistry, communication. Like it was huge. And all of a sudden it was like, this is, this is it. This is the, the bar, not the best. This is the minimum requirement necessary to be successful right now. And I'll find my flow and I'll take bits and I'll give bits in other areas. But I, I came in just like, this is who I have to be. And I had no idea how to do it. I had time as captain, obviously with Adelaide, but I hadn't always got it right. You say things wrong, you say things too much, you don't say enough, you don't say it at the right time, but you learn. Spent time with uh, some phenomenal, you know, sports psychs that, you know, Angela Powell, Dean Evans out there listening, if you are like incredible people. I spent a lot of time with Dean, spent some time with Ange and they just helped me understand myself more than anything. And then that allowed me to kind of help other people you know, feeling more comfortable and to help mm. them come along. Hey, it's okay. I got you. It's all right. Yeah. Sometimes you let them burn their hand on the door. Ah, see, it's hot. Told you. <laughs> and then you can kind of help them a little bit. And then it's like, okay, well, we're here together. Let's do this together. So there's been mistakes. There's been some errors. But there's been some great positives and great takeaways that we'll build and, and learn from. But yeah, you come into it. You've got no idea. Mm. I, 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 like I was nowhere near prepared. <laughs> But that club did a great job of helping me and the coaching staff and the high performance staff and Eric and all the physios and everyone and owners and everyone back of house, volunteers, like they all helped me believe in myself more than I probably did because they believed in me. Yeah. And I was like, if someone believes in me enough, Joey Wright believed in me in Adelaide and that's why I made the NBA. Joey was the reason. Yeah. And his belief made something of myself. So someone else's can make something as me too. So that's where it kind of started and that's how it grew. You spoke a little bit about sports psychs and things like that. In terms of like seeing a sports psych or a regular psych, was that ever like a stigma that you had to get over or you just welcomed it as a, you know, I'm going to better myself and this is the way I'm going to take it? Or was it something you had to kind of fight within yourself? Because I know that in sport, especially men's sport, that idea of, oh, I'm going to go see a psych to better myself can sometimes be seen as a weakness. Was that ever something that you struggled with or that just kind of flew kind of right over your head and you knew that's something that you needed to do to be better? Yeah, no, I, I knew it was going to be a struggle for me at first. I started talking and then it was like, I want to be better at basketball. I want to be better at this, that and the other. But then it was like, holy shit, I got some demons. Yeah. You know, you think about the times you, you go and you drink too much or you go out and you stay out too late or – you know, you say something you shouldn't have said or you snap back at someone who's a friend or you're just like, why am I putting myself in these situations? Like, why is that, you know, the black dog kind of mm -hmm. getting a hold of me? Like, you know, there's moments where I just, I can vividly remember thinking I need to talk to somebody because there were times where I was so unhappy that I was like, you're driving home and you're like, you know, completely dead honest thoughts were like you're driving home and it's like, I don't know if anyone would miss me. Like, yeah. I really don't. And you're like, it wouldn't take much. Like, I could just pull the wheel to the left mm -hmm. and it wouldn't matter. Like, no one would care. Yeah. Like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And to kind of go through that, I was like, like, I really got to kind of pull my head in and, like, see someone. And I was like, oh, yeah. And that went on for, like, fuck, three or four years, five yeah. years. And it's really hard to think about it now because if I – talk to someone sooner like I probably wouldn't have done some of the shit I've done in my life and yeah there's parts of my life where I've lied I've cheated I've stolen and I've been a bad person and I'm like fuck 
like I don't want to be that ever again. Like mm. I got to talk, and mm-hmm. it's such a hard stigma to break. Like, yeah, like trying to get myself to talk to somebody was so hard that you go in like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I fucking prepared for it. Like I was like, I'm gonna go in and talk to Annalie the psych, and it's just gonna be great. And yeah, I'm gonna fucking own this shit. And by the end of it, I was like talking about stuff that I was like, I didn't even know what the mm. fuck I was talking about. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I got out of there talking about two topics and I got a cheat sheet with 15 sentences with nothing close to what I thought was going on. Mm-hmm. And it was like four or five years of like talking, like consistently seeing someone. And it wasn't like every week, but it might have been every week, two weeks, week, two weeks, three weeks, month. And it was just a constant battle of like, who am I? Like, mm. I'm such bullshit. Like in my own head, I was like, I'm not a fucking, I'm not a good person. I'm, a, I'm an asshole. Yeah. And then it was like, actually, I am a good person. Why, why do I feel like I'm an asshole? Why do I feel like a bad guy? Why do I feel like I don't make anyone happy around me? Mm-hmm. Why do I feel like I take from others energy rather than give positive? And I went through such a dilemma of like, is it worth staying around to watch people become miserable around me because that's all I'm good for or is it worth fucking being honest and sitting there going, I don't have it all together. Yeah. I'm a mess. I'm completely fucked inside and that's okay. Yeah. But this trained professional could potentially help me. And I'll be honest, I went with uh, Ange was phenomenal. She allowed me to open up and bring out a little bit of softness Mm -hmm. and then Dean was the person that I connected with a little better and he had some really good, you know, so insights into his life and my life and how it could kind of coexist and, and work together. And it did. And it was just, man, like I, fuck, I owe that guy so much. Like it's every time I can, I'm like, I'd try and catch up with him to catch, you know, mm. a coffee or a beer or something. Yeah. Like he, like it even now, like it makes me kind of shake a little bit yeah. and you just, I just, yeah. It's a guy that like I owe my life to. Yeah. I mean, I can completely relate to like a lot of what you're saying. I, it took me a very long time to see a psych after, um, I had been struggling with mental health for years and years and years. But do you ever think that that, uh, I, I'll call it toxic masculinity in sport. And there's, there's, there's lots of other ways that you can kind of frame it. Do you think that that kind of kept you from opening up to your peers? Cause you know, looking back at it now, are you like, someone would have missed me. Someone would have cared. And, but in that moment, you can't feel it. Do you think that's held back by your surroundings of a sporting environment? Or is that something because you were such a high passionate driven person, you just couldn't see anything outside of, you know, what was right in front of you? Yeah. It's, it's a bit of both. I think it's a, the stigma around it at the time. Like I didn't realize, but looking back, I'm like, there would have been people that missed me. Like yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, but in your mind, you don't see that. Mm. You see yourself being a wreck. And when you see a mess or you see something you don't like, what do you do? You throw it in the bin. Mm. That's what I feel like doing. And, you you know, it's it's a subconscious thing we kind of tell ourselves without really knowing why we're telling ourselves that. So, to understand how to not negatively compound mental health issues and to kind of put more shit on top of shit. Yeah. It's, just, it's so hard. And if people don't understand it, haven't been through it, it's it's like teaching algebra to a four-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like all he wants to do is, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like what a four-year-old wants to do? Shit, yeah. and, shit and eat. Like, yeah. He doesn't want to – he doesn't care about algebra. Like, yeah. That's, but that's how you feel. You're like, mm. I'm trying to get no myself out of something. And they're, yeah. they're like, what, why don't you just be happy? Oh, God. And you're like, oh, my God, mate. Like I want to kick you in the shit. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, it was so tough to kind of get that stigma out of my own head. But looking back now, it's like I try and normalize it as much as possible. I try and talk about things as much as possible because some people are just like, shut up. No one cares. Like, cool, great. That's not for you. And that's okay. Mm. But it's for the guy who's suicidal. It's for the woman who's taken, you know, a, a risk at taking her own life. She's she's had a go once. And no, we don't want that. Yeah. Like, it's okay. Like, it's not a bad thing. Like, you're going to go through a bad period of time when you talk to someone and you feel like you can't trust them, that's a trained professional who legally cannot speak to anyone else. You are allowed to trust them. Yeah. And talking to someone that wasn't a friend, family member or any foe in the world, 
this is the best thing they ever did because that person, I didn't have to see again if I didn't book in. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. I, like, hey, you want to come back? Fuck off. No, yeah. I'm good. I yeah. unloaded all my shit. Mm-hmm. Well, you haven't done anything. You've just told me the problem. Let's fix it. Yep. Let's take some time to work on ourselves. Mm. And then it was like, okay, this really helped me. Like this got me through a bad period. And look, I've had many, I've had bad periods since. Like there's been things that have come up where I've really fallen back into bad places and really destructive self behavior and Mm. harm in ways where it's like, this isn't good for my mental or physical health whatsoever. And I should stop. And then like hours later, you're like, I should probably stop. Like (laughs) haven't Mm. done it yet. Like, come on, Mitch, Mm. this is it. And you can kind of pull yourself back into it because I've had a little bit of help along the way. But now it's like, I've really got to be mindful of other people and triggers and signs of, okay, this is something I got to keep my eye on. And I'll make a note of it. Mm. And then I might write it down somewhere and then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to make another note and I don't want people to go through what I went through. But in saying that, you can only lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it's such a bad stigma that's like, oh, no, you can't talk about this sometimes. Like we got to – you sometimes really have to be like, I'll sit there with you and hold your hand and we'll talk mm-hmm. about this together. Um, it's, it's a conversation that's very hard to start. But once you start, it's very hard to finish the conversation because you kind of like, well, this is really good for me. Yeah. And you realize there's such a positive and you're yeah. like, oh, shit, like I'm actually feeling better about myself. I feel comfortable in my own body. I don't have a body image anymore. Yeah. Went through a body image thing, a whole like young teens. Like yeah. I was rep- repulsed by my body. Yeah. You know, and I was like, I was thought like I look back now and I'm like, I was actually in pretty good. I was like, you know, not bad. Good like, neck. Not yeah. bad, Greek. Yeah. Like, well done for a 17 year old. Like, yeah. Did some push up. Did my 25 Did your 25 yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> But I, like at the time, I was so disgusted with how I looked. Yeah. And I was so self conscious. So, you know, just knowing that there is help if you are willing to seek just a little bit. Like I'm just, just do a little bit. I'm telling you, yeah. your life's worth it and it's going to be okay in the end. There are people that love you and they will definitely miss you. Yeah. I think that speaking about mental health, like it's such a massive thing to tackle and like for people like yourself um, and then, you know, me being in the female basketball area, just starting the conversation is super, super important. And I know it, it's uncomfortable at times for a lot of people. It's uncomfortable to talk about, but it helps people destigmatizing. It's so, so important. And I, you know, I wonder if, if there's more use, more people like you that want to talk about openly about the things that they've gone through. I, I just imagine that it would help so many young athletes going through the same thing. Like I guarantee you, there's a kid that's going to listen to this and it's like, holy shit, like Mitch went through this. There's no way we would have known, you know, he's, you know, he plays hard on the basketball court. There's no way we would have seen it, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I explain to people that don't really understand the whole mental health depression area that once you, your brain learns a thought pattern, you can never unlearn it. You only learn new ways around it. And moving forward from something that got you that low do you ever drop back down to those places or you can recognize yourself slipping and you now have the tools or what does that look like for you now when you feel yourself kind of slipping away from just being mentally in the right places? I've got a like a sequencing thing that I do now and it's with my fingertips is the first thing mm-hmm. to know that I'm present, I can feel myself. Mm-hmm. Second thing's breathing and then the third thing is just like a mindfulness thought of like, What's going on? Mm. And whatever it is, if it's a negative thought, I remember I was taught this and it was just like um, you, you tell yourself that that's not you and that will never be you. Mm-hmm. So whatever it is, you, you have a body image issue, it would be like I just get present with my fingers and then all of a sudden I take, you know, three seconds in, three seconds out, three nose in, exhale through your mouth, diaphragmatic breathing, start to center yourself a little bit, you start mm-hmm. to understand that. And if it was really bad anxiety or whatever it was going on was really high, it'd be two quick breaths in through the nose and then you'd exhale through your lips pursed like really, really aggressively. And you basically create a carbon dioxide flow where you get rid of more and you start to feel really lightheaded. But afterwards when you calm your breathing, you feel really relaxed. Mm -hmm. And that's a big stress reliever for people or anyone that suffer from anxiety. Give it a try. It's in through your nose twice. (laughs) And then really hard, sharp out through your mouth. Ten of those. 
and then just close your eyes and rest and you'll, you'll feel a little bit better. And if you don't, well, I tried. Um, but I just remember like that's now the, my process. Like every time it's like, oh, yeah, this is it. And it's like that is not me, that is not I, that it will never be me. Mm-hmm. And I tell myself in my mind two or three times, do some breathing and I just center myself and I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. Mm. I'm thankful for X, Y, and Z. A beautiful family, you know, your partner, it's, you know, your health, it's the relationships, it's being able to inspire young men and women. It's a whole bunch of things. Mm-hmm. But you got to remind yourself that it could be fucking worse. Yeah. It could be living on the street. You know, I could have no food, no money, no house. It's pissing rain outside. It's Melbourne. Mm. You know, you get sunny here. It's pissing down again. Oh, my God. And it's like, oh, I'm inside. How could I got my big comfy doona? And you're like, some poor man or woman or child is on the street. No food, no money, no one for them. Mm. And I'm complaining. And it's sometimes just not about making yourself feel you got to pull yourself down. Yeah. But it is sometimes. Yeah. you gotta, you got to check yourself and be like, yeah, life's pretty good. Yeah. And you're like, I've done nothing for someone else recently. I'm an asshole. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do something. Yeah. Get up, go down, offer some time, pour some soup, you yeah. know, have a conversation to that person on the street rather than walk past them. Try and remember that I'm human and it's okay not to be perfect. Yeah. I have no expectation to be the most incredible human in the world every single day because it's unrealistic to be that person. You mm-hmm. take so much from yourself, give to others, you'll have nothing left of yourself and you get that toothpick out again. Yeah. I don't want that. So I think it's now understanding I've got a process in place, remind yourself to be grateful and then understand that you can help someone else through a tough situation too who's got a little bit worse than you. And if you remind yourself of that when things are going on, you'll, uh, you'll put yourself in a little better position, I think. I agree with that 100%. It sounds a lot of what you just said is something that I actually use literally every day for my mindfulness stuff and I'm medicated so I, it helps a little bit more to bring me down a bit faster but that anxiety dealing with that and the mindfulness is that all the things that you're putting into your book to help the young kids that you work with yeah and look it's not i'm not it's not a hundred page turn yeah. it's literally like a dozen pages of little yeah. bits of information that i think describes what mental health is resilience is goal setting and just starts to break down how it's used in sport, how it's used in life, mm-hmm. gives a few, you know, examples of how to find indicators and everything. But it is, it's just putting those things in. And when it comes to the mental health part of it, it is a big thing in there. There's like six things. It's like your breathing, your, you know, no screen time for 30 minutes before bed, having your blinds drawn and open and a window, just a little bit of fresh air and sunlight naturally in the morning. Some of these things create a good balance for chemicals in the body to go, actually, this is really positive. Mm. Um, cold showers, like just really simple things that it's like kids won't do that because they want a hot shower. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Well, if your kid's a bit stressed at school or their anxiety is a bit high or they've, you know, diagnosed with ADHD, who knows what it is. Yeah. Some of these things really do help. And now it's not for everyone. Not everyone's going to get a positive reaction out of it and say, I'm going to keep doing it. But you might do it once, not find anything out of it. And then one day you might do it again and go, actually, I actually feel a little bit better. Yeah. And if they, they get that out of it, great. If you don't and you want to use it as firewood, Sweet. It's good kindling. <laughs> I don't mind. It's yeah. good paper. You can light it on fire. Yeah. Um, to kind of wrap up everything that we've spoken about, um, the one question that I, I really would like to ask you is how do you think other people see you versus who you actually are? And whether that's, you know, a one-liner or there's something that you want to kind of drag out, but how, how do you think other people see you? Um. I don't really know. I don't really care. <laughs> like I, I, I used to. Yeah. But a big part of me now is I've been projected upon so much that I don't really care and I've done enough work now to not give a shit. Mm-hmm. Like if you like me, cool. If you don't, that's okay. Not everyone's cup of tea. I don't yeah. like certain cups of tea. Yeah. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm past trying to win anyone's approval or to win a good comment or a positive – reinforcement i don't Mm. need that i've got my beautiful circle of people in my life and that's all that matters like if i can affect some positive change on other people mightn't be you listening or watching but it's okay you mightn't be everyone's cup of tea either buddy yeah you know like uh, I, i don't understand how people can really 
think that what they have to say should be heard by someone else if it's not positive. Mm. And unfortunately, social media and the life we live is now full of negative projection untoward others. It's just bullshit. And for anyone that thinks of that question, he goes, I wonder how anyone sees me. I hope you feel the same way I do because you'll probably be a little bit happier if you mm. are because it's hard to – it's really hard to get to this point. But I'm in a position now where I'm thankful enough to go, you know what? It doesn't fucking matter. I don't fucking care. It, I don't care and it's great. Mm. But it doesn't mean I can be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, fortunately enough, I try and make sure that I do give the best of myself when I can. And there's mm-hmm. been one or two moments in the last couple of months where I'm like, damn, I hope I get to see that person again. Because at the time I was in my own head thinking about something else, doing other things. And I didn't give them much and I probably seemed rude. Mm. And I'm really sorry if you felt that way because mm. that's not who I want to be. And as I said, affecting positive change, being a pretty good role model where I can you know, bringing joy to people. I hope that's what people think and see and that I give genuine care and genuine time. But yeah, all the things I'd like them to think, you know, whether they think it or not, as I said, doesn't matter. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for being so vulnerable and just talk like dropping wisdom. Um, there's, I actually think we could speak for the next six hours about this stuff. This and is the first time we've ever actually sat down I know, and talked to. I know. I think there was, there's like going to have to be an episode three, yeah. four, five, six, seven. And I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next time we get to sit down and talk about this stuff because it's so powerful and so fucking impactful. And it means so much that you were able to sit down and talk about this stuff. And I cannot wait for people to hear this listen to it, feel it, and take so much out of what we just spoke about. Um, I think the, the, the boundaries for what we can talk about and where we can go with this stuff is absolutely limitless. And I think that you embodied and were able to communicate so much of that. And I'm grateful that you sat down and um, we're very happy to have you. And until next time, thank you so much, Mitch. All right, thank you. <laughs>